I am Haley Harrington. I actually just finished up my doctorate in occupational therapy. You know, the, the very essence of the mental game is this. The only reason an event matters is because we make it matter. Welcome to the Mullins Farrier Podcast. Every horse, whatever it was doing, had a season. Once their competition season finished, they took the shoes off, they chucked it out in the field with some other horses, and it had a two, maybe three months period where it went and remembered what being a horse was all about. Even in a cheaper area, your prices should be set by your skill level, by your experience. And some people might not feel that they're worth, you know, as much as others. But if you're only charging $160 to shoe a horse, then the only way you're making money is on your trims. The WCB was a way to to make sure that you kept the trade alive. I think I'm a custodian of the trade. So it's like we have to keep it going. It was hard, but, you know, you adapt and overcome and that probably gets to me where I am now it's problem solving horseshoeing's problem solving and back in the day it was problem solving how to be as strong as the older apprentices so it's all about adapting and overcoming which was good I know we learn every day but you do have to put yourself outside the box and I'm just continue to learn which is why I was just trying to do my fellowship because I still have apprentices and if I stay at my AW I'm stagnant Welcome everyone. A short bit of shopkeeping for you today. I get a lot of requests from listeners for guests. And one of those requests came from my good friend Andrew DeVisser. He recommended a farrier and toolmaker named Tyler Jose. Tyler had reached out to Andrew for financial advice many years ago. And as any listener to this podcast would know, Andrew has been our resident business guru when it comes to all things, keeping track of your finances and improving your bottom line. Andrew's tutelage has made a huge difference in my business and business practices, and apparently he did the same for Tyler. And well, since Andrew has never led me astray with his advice, I put Tyler on the hit list. And then as fate would have it, Tyler reached out to me. As it turns out, he's a longtime listener and big fan of the podcast, and he wanted to support it in his own unique way. Tyler has made a beautiful rounding hammer that he wanted to donate to the podcast so that we could auction it off and use the proceeds to make more episodes. So keep an eye out on our social media pages as we will be posting pictures of this hammer. And stay tuned as our next episode will be my interview with Tyler, where he explains some of the changes that he made based on Andrew's advice and how they improved his business and his lifestyle, basically. In that episode, I will share the details on how we are going to run this auction and then let the bidding begin. I was introduced to today's guest last year at the AFA convention. Haley was wrapping up a project that she had done to complete her doctorate in occupational therapy, and her research project had some very specific relevance to what we do. So a few months later, we were able to finally sit down and chat about the details of this research project. In our conversation, Haley reveals a lot of details about things that we could do to improve the longevity of our careers and just our overall physical health. She offers quite a few takeaways, and I hope you find them useful. As you will hear, Haley is pretty passionate about farriers and helping us to improve our work lives. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So this project that we're going to talk about today actually was my doctoral capstone project that makes up the difference between a master's and a doctorate. Wow. Cool. To explain to a person who's completely not aware of what's involved with that, what as an occupational therapist would you do? Occupational therapy is different depending on what setting you're in. And that's really interestingly why I got into it. And what I love about it was 
at any point, if I were to get bored with maybe whatever I'm doing, or maybe I just hit like a plateau or I don't feel like I'm, I'm getting into much, I can change my setting at any given point. It's really, really focused on like functional outcomes. So just a very generic example would be like an individual who has a stroke. After something like that, we would help them be able to do things like bathe themselves, dress themselves, manage their own medications. And my passion sort of fell more in with vocational type rehab, which is back to work. And my fiance was actually a farrier for a little bit. Every day he was coming home, like my back hurts, my knees hurt, (laughs) this hurts, that hurts. And I was like, there's something to that. Like there has to be. Of course, I, I did a little research. Come to find out there wasn't very much research on it at all. And that just took me into this really awesome rabbit hole that I got to spend six months really diving into some really interesting stuff. So you're preaching to the choir when you say about being able to to change directions and, and like plateauing. And because with farriers, I think that's one reason a lot of us get into it is because you really can't get bored in this particular <laughs> career. <laughs> now, with your fiance, what ended up happening? Did he get out of the job completely or? Yeah, he his justification was, I don't want to be bent over under horses for the rest of my <laughs> life. And he actually builds metal buildings nowadays, which I don't see how that's much <laughs> right. better, but that's none of my business. <laughs> <laughs> Just as hard in the body, I am assuming. Your particular project that you did, you actually studied farriers, right? Yeah. And it was actually a very base level type project. So I did what's called a phenomenological qualitative study where I went and I interviewed various farriers. And I actually had a very small number of farriers, but they all gave me a lot of the same information, which is really, really good for what I needed. But I did interviews with them and asked various questions about previous injuries, uh, their current strategies for like taking care of their bodies, some of like the adaptations they may have to their tools or their truck or what their like ideal work environment would look like, what their setup would look like. That's that's pretty much the gist of it. Like there were some very overarching questions. Of course, each farrier gave me a little bit of different information regarding the specific questions. And so I pieced that apart. What are different people doing and what do they know about being able to take care of their bodies and and things like that? Okay. (laughs) I imagine in choosing us as farriers to study for your thesis, that has to be a real easy one as far as there's going to be some issues with body position, all kinds of stuff, work environments, the hazards of the horses. What were some of the outcomes after teasing all of that information out. So initially I was like, this is going to be a cake project, (laughs) right? And then I get into it and I start to break it down and physically back, hip, upper extremity, like your hands and your arms. Those were some areas that farriers really, really commonly reported regular pain or lots of injuries. And that was actually really, really hard to tease out because I also had a lot of barriers that were like, I hurt everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I had to take a look at the big picture and look at what everybody was saying and then try and find the most common ground. That's really the biggest part of the kind of research that I did was having to get into each individual interviews and find a big picture. You want to tell everybody the whole story, each individual person's story when you do a project like this. That's not what the purpose of it was. But based on what I did find, I am still able to tell a really, really great story and hopefully one day justify and create really awesome services that could really, really help farriers and affordable for that matter, because we all know healthcare is not affordable (laughs) these days. Well, it depends on where you are. Where I'm from, it's actually paid for, but we pay for it in our taxes, regardless. <laughs> now, how many farriers would you have interviewed to do this? So I wound up interviewing 15 
Okay. 15 barriers in total. And just due to incomplete information or the occasional inappropriate responses. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what? From farriers? Yeah. I had to take a few out. And my final overall data included like nine farriers. Okay. Two of which were women, which was really cool. Okay. Yeah. That was another question I had for you. So some of the big pictures that I teased out from this, one of them we kind of briefly talked about, but the commonly reported areas of like pain or injury. Another one was those ideal work preferences as far as like the setting or where they're at or what would make their job easiest, basically, based on the environment. Injury prevention strategies was another one. So what knowledge did barriers have of injury prevention and what steps are they taking to prevent their injuries? Okay. And then another one was a reluctance to seek medical services. And that could be for a lot of things, for cost reasons, for placement, like if you're too far from a medical facility, there was a lot that went into that. And then another one was equine and client interaction. So the actual interactions with the horse or actual interactions with clients themselves or how they've trained animals to be around farriers and other equine care individuals, if you will. Right. Like I said, on the commonly reported areas of pain and injury, back and hip pain, and then our upper extremity. So of course, we have a lot of men and women that are tearing up their hands with the tools that they use or the nails that they're driving or the knives that they're using. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lots of hip pain. And one really big connection I made there was the farriers that I interviewed anyway, all had lots of drive time under their belt. Yep. They were all driving, even if they were at the same barn all day, it was probably a barn that was an hour and a half, two hours away. And so you've got three to four hours of drive time in there. But after you do all this physical labor all day long and then go and sit in a vehicle for four hours, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> yes. You're going to stiffen up like, concrete right and then back pain really it's the same way but also with the aspect of having to bend over repeatedly underneath multiple horses all day long mm -hmm. that was an obvious one right <laughs> yeah and then for like ideal work conditions this one was one of the easier ones to tease out because i just had the same things coming in what does your ideal work environment look like and they were like lots of space level ground concrete floors <laughs> <laughs> well lit shaded covered no rain <laughs> no hot weather. We don't ask for much. Out of the elements. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> but a really, really interesting one was tool adaptations, like how people change up their setting with their tools specifically or like their truck. One thing I noticed was that everybody's truck is different. Yes. Everybody's like day-to-day -day setup is so very different as far as several factors, like the height of their actual trucks, how they're organized. Which, of course, organization is sort of a personal preference, but some people had their tools where they were able to just slide out and they were super accessible. Oh, the anvil. The anvil was the big <laughs> one. Everybody's anvil is at a different height. But I think that's super great that just by figuring out what hurts and what doesn't hurt, we're able to make these very individual changes in my nerd brain. I'm over here. <laughs> I'm over here like, that's really cool because they don't even know that they're doing the best thing for their body statistically. And then they just figure it out because it feels better to do <laughs> right. it the right way. Right. And so in my mind, I'm like, I can help you. And this is proof that I can help you. This one thing right here, you change things based on what feels better. And I can show you the best ways to do things. But that's kind of the point of the project is to figure out where that need is, and then hopefully be able to implement those changes or implement that education to be able to help facilitate those changes. Right. So I was always taught with an anvil that you stand next to it and hold your hand at your side relaxed. And if your clenched fist rests on the anvil, that's about where you want it to be. Exactly. Yeah. That was something I'd heard, but also standard doing like, say, warehouse or corporate work environment analysis, I would say hip level for like a standing working space. 
But with you guys, you're doing a lot of really heavy and repeated hammering on an anvil. Anytime you're using an anvil, you're having to put in tough work. So to have that extra leverage to be a little bit lower. And of course, everybody's fist is at a different height <laughs> yeah, right. when you're sitting yeah. next to an anvil. So making sure that you take the time to adjust that, that one little thing may keep you from having back pain that prevents you from playing with your kids right. that right. evening. I had also been told that if you raise the anvil slightly, so say you're having shoulder pain or something like that, or even back pain, that raising the anvil a bit would help that. Is that something that you would agree with, or is that beyond the purview of this particular project? Honestly, it wasn't something that I, I looked into super heavily with this project. Most of my guys were super comfortable with their current anvil height and weren't talking about a lot of things like shoulder pain. And honestly, from my perspective, our joints over time naturally break down. And a good way to help something break down faster is to use it more, <laughs> right? Right. So we do things like repetitive swinging and shoulder motions. And of course, that force is sent back into our big joints, like our wrists, our elbows, our shoulders. And that just naturally, I mean, I don't really know if it matters that your <laughs> anvil is at a lower or a higher height, because those repetitive motions are going to break you down no matter what. And a lot of guys will probably, like I said, I haven't studied this question in particular. It wasn't super heavy in my project, but I think just by seeing these guys do this every day, I think naturally um, over time, you would have a lot more guys say, oh yeah, my dominant shoulder bothers me. That's the one I hammer with. If you're going to have somebody say that a particular body part bothers them every day over time, that would that would probably be the reason, just repetitive motions. Okay, sorry I sidetracked you a bit there. <laughs> no, no, you're good. The hard part about my project was it wasn't aimed at me providing solutions. It was aimed at me finding a need for solutions. Does that make sense? Yeah. I saw these areas that could be improved on and... I want to eventually do something with that. If it, if it means hosting like a half day clinic every so often, or just speaking to where barriers are become more aware of these issues. And then maybe they're like, oh, maybe I should be a little bit more cognizant about how I'm sitting in the truck or stretching my shoulder to make sure that I don't tear it apart while it's still cold or something like that. Yeah, well, even the, the sitting in the truck, is there something that we could do that just offhand you would suggest? There's all kinds of adaptations people can make simply to their driver's seat that people just don't know about. Most vehicles are made, manufactured with very basic lumbar support. Some vehicles have adjustable seats to where you can air up to where you have a little bit more lumbar support. But there's things like you can get off of Amazon that are better lumbar support. So you can just leave in the truck, of course, being cognizant of how you're sitting. Because a lot of times, especially when we drive for a really long time, drive in and we sort of end up. <laughs> yep. Hunched over the steering wheel. Yes. Especially after a long day of work and you just get like super tired and you just don't care right. anymore. Yeah. But that simple change just opens up so much. And posture is a huge thing, no matter what, for anybody in any line of work, because that's natural. Right. We get tired and we just go, bleh. Mm -hmm. Slouch down. It changes so much when you pay attention to it. And any chiropractor will tell you that. And I know that barriers <laughs> believe in chiropractors. So Yeah, I know myself and quite a few friends who've been repaired by chiropractor if you swear by a chiropractor that's totally cool but i will 110 percent agree with them that being cognizant of how your posture is can change your entire life yeah <laughs> <laughs> right so other than the lumbar support like heated seats is that something you would recommend i know a lot of people utilize that option personally i love a good heated seat when i'm having some low back pain in the morning <laughs> right. honestly I would even go further to recommend a 
heated pad, something that's meant to heat up those muscles. Oh, okay. Because I don't think a heated seat is really meant to get warm enough or something like that. Right. After you've finished working all day, it might help with pain relief, but I would honestly recommend it more in the beginning of the day so that you can start to warm up those muscles. In addition to taking five to 10 minutes before you ever get underneath a horse to stretch, simple stretches, touch your toes, turn, turn, shoulder, shoulder, like just simple stretches, just basic injury prevention type things. And you'd be surprised at how many farriers I had actually admit to doing yoga and Pilates <laughs> to keep themselves. Yep, yep. I love that. That's awesome because those individuals figured out that, hey, I feel a lot better when I'm not stiff as a board all the time. <laughs> yep. Imagine that. Congratulations. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's been a hindrance. Like even you saying about the stretching, it was funny. I was at the international farrier competition. It's like world competition in England. Well, and even at the convention where we met, we met in the competition arena. Most of those people, I would hazard at least 90% of them never stretch or warm up or anything before the bell rings and their, their go is on. So you think of how much, uh, like any other athlete would, have a regimen of stretching and things beforehand and uh for some reason i think there is that sort of machismo sort of affecting people's pre-work regimens i guess maybe probably a really really key piece to keeping muscles even bones and ready to go is just a quick pre and it doesn't have to be something where you have to wake up a whole hour early and do a whole work. I'm not saying go be a bodybuilder to condition yourself to be a farrier, but to take the extra 10 to 15 minutes just to keep yourself from pulling something that day or having a muscle that spasms for two hours after you get home, after it's finally kind of calmed itself down or keeping you away, whatever, whatever it may be, it's the little things. Yeah. I'll bring us back to the tool adaptation. <laughs> So the anvil height was one of the things. What's another common thing that you found? Hammer handles. Yes. Which everybody has a different hand. That never crossed my mind. I was like, oh, it's just a hammer, right? Yep. No, it's a hammer that they hold every single day. It's not really a tool adaptation, more of like a tool maintenance type thing, but maintaining your knives and taking care of those. Yes, for sure. The less you have to like, wiggle and yank on a knife, the less likely you are, one, to cut yourself and less likely you are to put that additional strain on your hands, wrists, elbows, so on and so forth. That was a fun one. But every every single person, for a fact, told me that they changed hammer handles. Yeah. I thought that was hilarious. I was like, oh, okay. Everybody changes their hammer handles. Got it. Awesome. Good. I worked for years without modifying mine and had a lot of arm pain. And it was only after I learned how to properly tune a handle to fit my particular hand. And then as we speak right now, I'm a month and a bit away from getting carpal tunnel surgery. And one of the things that I really found helped with the numbness was actually wrapping my hammer handle with a tennis wrap for the concussion because that transfers directly through your arm in your hand and, and elsewhere. I found that cushioning really helped and to the point that I was even using it on my just my little driving hammer for nailing up shoes. Just to absorb some of that yes, shock every time exactly. you Exactly. Because basically that shock, I had it explained to me, causes that band that's at the bottom of your hand, top of your wrist, to just basically build scar tissue upon scar tissue until it starts to pinch the nerves and then you lose feeling in your hands, which I'm sure pretty much everybody in this audience will probably experience. <laughs> so anything you can do to remove that repetitive concussion, like wrapping your hammer handles, which I thought was something that only grandpas would do, it's life-changing. It, it's made a huge difference. One of the really fun things that I got to experience doing this was seeing how interested some of the younger guys were because I had a really healthy mix of like younger guys and very 
much more experienced farriers. And it was really interesting to me to see how hungry some of these younger guys were to prolong their career. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, let's look at it from like a money perspective. Say, I add five years to your career by helping you maintain your body and protect your body. How much extra money does that give you when you don't have to retire at a young age because you simply can't do it anymore? Right. Right. Yeah. But it, it was really cool to see. And I had a couple other younger guys that were just like, I don't think you're going to find very many farriers that are interested in this. Well, the ones that want to prolong their career, I think will be. Yeah, for sure. I don't know many that wouldn't be interested in it. Some of those injury prevention techniques, again, stretching, drinking lots of water, especially on those super, super hot days. Because like the last thing we need is somebody to stroke out from heat stroke or something. <laughs> uh, protective clothing. Uh, that was a really big one. Nobody forgets their chaps before they go under a horse or their apron before they go under a horse. That's a big one. And then chiropractic care. Like I said, barriers love chiropractors and I love that for them. <laughs> <laughs> now, another thing I have found, I've actually had a couple chiropractors say to me, if the muscles that are attached to those bones are taut, they can adjust you all day, every day, and it's still going to pull out. If you're not doing the work, if you're not stretching yourself, if you're not keeping those muscles in a way that they need to be, then you're just going to have to keep going. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure they love that because they're like farriers give us so much money. <laughs> <laughs> That's also an argument for massage therapy. And I go to one every two weeks if I can. And massage therapy really is a great thing because we do end up with some of those even with stretching every day, even people who do yoga every day, even people who really do stay on top of it. Sometimes you just get knots and kinks and things that have to be worked out by somebody who knows how to get in there and work them out. But you're right. Chiropractors really focus more on like the bones and where they're at and they can adjust you, but those muscles are just going to pull it, pull it back where it was before yeah. if nothing's done about it. So I don't know how accurate my medical services section was, but some of the things that I was finding as far as uh, reluctancy around medical <laughs> services was. <laughs> yeah, I know where this is going. Yeah. So like a lack of planning for emergent medical treatment. It seems like a lot of times these guys end up in situations where they're just like, no biggie, I can fix it. <laughs> Field medicine. I had one guy, I was like, so he had told me a story about how he had gotten a nail he had driven a nail through the horse's foot and then into his finger and it came all the way down out of his finger and then like down his leg and i was like oh my gosh like did you go to the emergency room he's like no <laughs> i glued it shut and i was in shock i would have passed out i would have needed emergent medical care he's like it's fine and if it didn't glue together i would have stapled it <laughs> shut on your own <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> yes there's a lot of issues like that. I've done many of them myself. I actually did a ride along with a gentleman. I never asked him the story, but his finger had clearly been broken by a horse or something years ago because it just kind of flopped around. It was like his middle finger and it just sort of, it wasn't mobile and he just worked around it. And you do see a lot of adaptation. We were just talking about that earlier about free health care up in Canada, I know lots of farriers, even with that available, were either too busy or too tough to get some of those things fixed as well. We just sort it out ourselves and carry on. I truly don't know what that is. I think here in our situation, a lot of farriery isn't like a corporate business. So you don't have commercial insurance or, or anything like that. A lot of these guys are, if they do need medical services, they have to pay out of pocket for them. And it costs a fortune down there. It does. Or they have a really big fund set aside in case something happens. Right. And you never want to have to dig into that. But another thing was, it's not really something that they plan for. They just kind of go to work and 
like word for word, one of the one of the interviews that I did, I was like, so what do you do in a situation where you really do need medical care? And he was like, you just kind of hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you have a really sketchy job. So like maybe we should just in case maybe. I mean, just a basic emergency plan, like who's on my emergency call list if I'm and a lot of times we go to some of the same same barns on a routine period or some of the same places on a routine period or some guys work in um, a really tight space where they have several clients within like a 50 mile radius. So what's the closest medical or emergency facility or quick care clinic within that? little radius just a basic again i'm not asking you to be a bodybuilder here (laughs) but like maybe we do have a quick plan for what the heck do i do if things go south that way in that situation we're not stressing ourselves out about what do i do next another thing that i noticed was especially individuals who had quite a big operation always had a helper or an assistant somebody that finished for them or pulled shoes or, or whatever grunt work, if <laughs> yeah, you will, yeah. for lack of better words. But I feel like those were probably some of the best taking care of individuals because they had an extra body there that if something did happen, there was someone there who knew. And I had one lady tell me that even when she didn't have a helper, she hated being in the barns alone. She wouldn't work on a horse if there wasn't somebody at least within the area that could hear her or here if something happened because it really did terrify her to be in a situation where maybe she gets heaven forbid like knocked out and then there's no one there to help her because you guys do work with really like volatile animals they do what they want when they want and they're big enough to do that yep and it's usually the ones you don't expect it from that something happens a spook or whatever my friend elisa she was working in a barn on her own and she woke up on the floor She'd been barreled over by a horse and had a pretty severe head injury. One of the things I was thinking of as you were describing this and having a plan, I've heard of other people doing this, and it's probably not a bad idea. I I admit I don't have one myself, but even just a card somewhere on your rig accessible that has your contact information, your blood type or insurance or or your health, a picture of your health card for up here. That just in those situations, because yeah, sure, maybe you get knocked down and there is somebody there, but just for them to have that extra information. So, so to piggyback on that, what kind of a phone do you have? iPhone. You have an Apple iPhone. You can set up an emergency ID card on your Apple iPhone and you always have your phone with you. Do you not? Of course. Yeah. You can set up an emergency ID card that has all of that information. Who? Somebody would need to call in the event of an emergency, your basic medical information, any serious conditions that you may have, your blood type, who your doctor is, so on and so forth. And it's accessible to any first responding individual that may need it, even when your phone is locked. There's things that we can do and they're super simple adjustments. It's just the question kind of is like, why aren't we making them? Why are we reluctant? I wasn't even aware that was a thing. Yeah. Even paper and pencil for Maybe somebody who just has a quick little flip phone, that burner phone for just their business or whatever. But yeah, right. pencil and paper that just has your very basic information. And maybe it's in the visor of your truck where you could see it. Anybody could see it if they needed it. Well, oh, that's good advice. So I guess that is that screen that when you go to shut it down or whatever. Yeah, that's what that is. The SOS call or I guess to find out all the info. So let's talk about equine interactions. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. Those are always fun. So basic equine behaviors. I'll ask you, since you've been a farrier, um, what are some of the basic equine behaviors that you watch for to save yourself or to be able to predict a kind of, hey, that's that situation's not going to go well. Maybe we need to back off of him for a minute or maybe he needs drugs or whatever the situation may be. What are some of those basic behaviors that you watch for in in horses? Well, you can usually see it as they walk them up the aisle towards you. If I can, I always try to watch the horse walking anyways. But if you see them with their ears perked up, they sound like a dragon because they're snorting. 
and looking everywhere. And also the the frequent pooping usually is a pretty good indicator that the horse is nervous. And I guess we all deal with new horses from time to time. I have a pretty steady group that I, I don't have to deal with many new ones very often. But yeah, I, I look for those things. Are they standing still in the cross ties? Do they look relaxed or not? What happens when they first interact, like when you interact with them? And uh, we all sort of learn to see those indicators. And I think you just kind of hit it right on the head right there is we learn to see yeah. those behaviors. So who do you think is most at risk of injury because they don't know? newer farriers right okay yeah they haven't had the time to be around them or they've only been around i mean maybe they've been around horses all their life and they know some but not all of us have and some of these guys get into this for extra beer money on the weekends and they don't know what they're getting into and then they get kicked across the barn and it's like you could have seen that coming proper mentorship yeah going around with somebody before you ever try to start your own situation or whatever the case may be, you make sure that you get mentorship from these guys who do know what to look for and who do know what to watch out for. But also some sort of basic education, research. There's tons of veterinarians, I'll say veterinarians, and individuals that have put information out there that do know what to look for. It's not just barriers, just equine professionals that do know what to watch for and if you do end up in a situation you kind of already had a precursor for i shouldn't have been there yeah very often if you get into a bad situation and you're right especially when you're new like i'd worked with horses since the age of 12 and i learned a lot but doing the things that a farrier has to do with them was a lot different than the way i interacted with bringing them in and out and basic horse handling stuff yes i got into a lot of situations where when i thought back on it yeah i had every indicator that things were about to go very very wrong and i just ignored them because i wasn't even aware but each instance kind of taught me so it is good like you said to have a mentor who's already maybe even run into those situations the gentleman I apprenticed under, he was really good at reading horse behavior. He'd worked with them his whole life. And that was one thing that I really did learn off of him, where there were a few cues that meant that things were about to go wrong and, and get out. Exactly. But yeah, I, I mean, you made another really good point too. Farriers are in different positions with horses than somebody who's handling them or in the stall cleaning up around them or even on horseback, you know, you're underneath them hitting some of those tickle spots that <laughs> some of them don't feel very often, or some of them may have never felt. And yeah. it's scary and it takes a sensory breakdown for them to finally get used to that. But again, right back into it, there's always some sort of indicator that something could possibly go wrong right now and of course you have those ones where they've been fine with the farrier time and time again and then one day maybe they're just having a bad day and it breaks down and maybe those indicators are a bit more subtle and it's harder to see them but again knowing what to look for and if you catch one indicator that something might go wrong maybe you give him you give him some space for a while and save yourself a serious situation right especially as a new person i guess you end up in more situations like that because you are working on the horses that nobody else will take on yeah <laughs> but the other thing is so you're already kind of trying to look past a lot of those indicators because they're gonna be there but you also just want to be able to get it done so you can get paid which is something that when you're starving that's what you're doing and sometimes it's just not worth because that horse could put you out for a month or six months or your career. So for that one trim or shoeing job or whatever, it just, it wasn't worth all of that. Exactly. <laughs> but that is a struggle for somebody new. 
I put myself through it a lot and it wasn't always to a good result. And even for somebody who has a very established operation, maybe they just want to go and get the work done and they're frustrated and ready to go home. But again, is it worth it to get home 30 minutes sooner? Or go back the next day after they've located some trank and... Exactly. Again, the very basic behaviors, knowing what to look for, but also uh, learning as a farrier to have that horsemanship and learn what to look for. I guess all that in a nutshell to say that I think farriers should take the time to learn and experience good horsemanship with other experienced farriers. And then animal-related injuries. (laughs) They're very frequent. And it's one thing that I noticed about anybody who reported an injury, like an injury from being cut or stabbed with a nail or a knife or whatever, very seldomly was it separate from being under the horse. So the horse kicked or yanked or jerked or set back or or whatever, whatever the situation may have been. But when you have a knife, a really, really sharp knife in your hand, or you still have nails that haven't been cut hanging out of a horse's freshly shod foot. Like, ah, again, no one what to look for. (laughs) No one what to look for. It stresses me out. I am so glad that in the time I got to run around with barriers, I never saw a serious injury. I chose occupational therapy because I don't want to deal with your blood and your guts. I want to help you get better. <laughs> I don't want to see that business and I'll pass out. I'll hit the floor. <laughs> but I had one guy that was telling me that, well, he still works on a lot of yearlings to my knowledge. I don't know if that's changed, but he just moves through them. He's a machine. Yep. And he's young. He's my age. He's, he's 25 years old and he's just don't care. Keep going. No big deal. <laughs> But he's like, yeah, I had one uh, kick me really good, broke three ribs. But luckily, it was the last horse of the day. So I got to go home, rest it off, and go back the next day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, like, breathing, was that cool with three broken ribs? Or, like, how were you doing in that situation? Couldn't imagine working the next day uh, on a rangy earling, right? Yeah, They're going to push on the parts that hurt for sure. For sure. And just the nature of how you have to be underneath them just to get where you need to be to do the job. like It's going to be uncomfortable. So again, he has very much earned the title of machine. Horse shoeing, farrier, yearling trimming machine. Kind of the last one was client interactions. and. I don't think there was one farrier that said that all their client interactions were great. They never had inappropriate client interactions or, you know, they'd never had sticky situations with clients. But clients may own horses and have a basic knowledge of how to take care of them and their feet. But maybe they don't have education around horses. So you've got a horse that's yanking or jerking on you or kind of just being a jerk and they're over there petting on them (laughs) and loving on them and it's like what are you doing you're teaching them that it's okay to do that right yeah yeah Um, the wrong training yeah so clear lack of education around horses which kind of surprised me because i was like well if you're going to be a horse owner you should know things about horses and every guy was like you should (laughs) but they don't (laughs) no and i think the pandemic brought that out even more because so many more people bought horses or or discovered they had horses in their backyard that they never rode or whatever. And I I can say it's a worldwide problem. I've talked to people from England and elsewhere, and yeah, they all say the same thing. There are more horse owners without any horsemanship skills out there now. And it's tough because you, as the farrier, become the person who has to instruct them on how to train their horse. And sometimes there's a reluctance to do that. I think that they don't always receive it because they don't understand how difficult it makes y'all's job. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But also there were other issues 
discussed too, like clear lack of conduct, being dishonest about the horse's behavior. Oh, he's never he's never bitten anybody. <laughs> We've all heard that long. That ago. sucks. That's not cool. No. You have this huge animal and you're putting somebody else like seriously at risk because why? Yeah. And it may be hard to find a farrier, but horse owners should also be very much educated on how they present their situation with the animal that they own. All that to say that this isn't just up to farriers to educate their clients. The clients also need to be educated, which I've kind of thought about having like a secondary type of situation that may where I was able to give clients like basic information on be honest with your farrier, pay them on time. Don't <laughs> don't just stay out of their way unless they ask for your help type things. Mm -hmm. But in more professional terms, if that makes sense. I'm sure you probably in those discussions heard some of the farriers say that they'll actually prefer the client not be there because sometimes the horse's behavior is worse when they are. Mm -hmm. I had one farrier in, in particular that she just kind of got fed up and started really sticking to her guns and having solid standards. And it, it was really simple. She would leave. Yeah. Yeah. She was like, I'm not, I'm not going to stay here. Like, it's not just my job to take care of your horse and, you know, take care of their feet. It's your job as the horse owner to take care of me and make sure that I have all the information that I need and right. all the materials that I need too. She's like, it's not my job to provide drugs for your animals. So like in a situation where we do need to make him a little sleepy time, <laughs> that's your responsibility. And you need to be available if I, if I need that, or you need to have a trainer or somebody available. If I need that, it goes right back into other things. Like if you have a client that you've already told, like, Hey, it, it really does make my job a lot easier. I've noticed that the horse is a lot more calm when you're not in the direct vicinity of him. And then they keep doing that. And that sucks because sometimes you don't get to take home a paycheck. But then again, what happens if you end up in a situation where you don't get to go to work the next day because you're hurt, hurt, hurt. Yep. Or the horse gets hurt and then the client. Is trying to throw that on you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just on the topic of clients sort of lying about behaviors and stuff like that. I've also had clients lie about what the horse needs, even shoeing wise, and telling you that the vet asked that you do this or whatever. And I've learned over time that the equine professionals should all just cut the customer out of the middle and talk to each other directly. And it helps to avoid some of those situations. I've had them outright lie about a certain shoe package, all because they just had it in their head that that's what they wanted. And in talking with the vet, which they didn't realize, I guess, that we had a direct line to each other, I learned that that was absolutely not what they wanted. So things like that, more often than not, it's more dangerous for the horse if, if they're sort of trying to get you to do something that isn't appropriate for the horse. But I mean, I guess that could happen with our safety as well. You said it right there. That's just another way of protecting yourself is making sure you have that contact with any other equine professional involved in whatever animal is in question or whatever client is in question. And if you do end up in a situation where, you know, they want you to do something, but like they haven't consulted a vet. No. Yeah. <laughs> It's basic standards. And like you said, though, there's some people that will get in there and just do it so that they can take home a check. But what's that doing for you and you know your your own business or operation or, or whatever you have going? It's doing a lot of things not in your favor. Is what is it doing? Yeah, exactly. Oh, I asked about mental health. That was fun. <laughs> yes. It told me a lot of things. One of the my final two questions in my interview were, would you be interested in a program aimed at injury prevention? Majority of barriers said yes, minus one or two. And then would you be interested in a program aimed at improving your mental health? And I actually had the majority of barriers say yes, because yep. they were like, this job takes a toll on your body and 
when you're really, really busy, sometimes your personal life. And wow, I'm thoroughly impressed. You know, with those two pieces together, it really set a foundation for what I was trying to do, which was show that barriers are interested and could benefit from education programs aimed at just helping them protect themselves in more ways than just their bodies. Mm-hmm. That that was probably one of my favorite favorite pieces to tease out of it. But I was able to put those those two questions together and some of the responses that I got from that and really draw a really big picture from that that again set that foundation for my goals for my project. Okay, and that's what I was going to ask you is that a next step for you to create those programs? I would love to. I really would. There is of course a cost element to which is why I was really super interested in meeting and chatting with you because you know just having like the word of mouth that hey there's this girl out there in the world that wants to provide education to barriers. Mhm. I'd love to be able to put on like like I said a clinic where I am able to teach some basic body and maybe there's not a, a horse in the room but some also just like basic exercises that like you can sit on the couch and watch your favorite TV show but they're doing things like strengthening the muscles of your hand and your arm just to be able to prevent some of those repetitive injuries and change some of the motions that you're doing throughout the day. Again, just to change it up so you don't have those repetitive strain injuries and working out some of that repercussion from your hammers and heavy tools that did go back and through your arm all day. I mean, there's stuff out there for that. And I'd love to be able to compile it and get it out in the world. I happen to know that a lot of the Farrier magazines are always looking for articles. So that might be a way to sort of promote yourself, but also offer information at the same time. Yeah, I think there'd be a huge demand for what you're offering, because as you already found out from your sample, <laughs> relatively small compared to how, how many farriers there are out there, we are looking for anything that help us continue in our careers as long as possible. And as happy as possible. Right. Happy, comfortable, all the things. Mm -hmm. I actually have looked into some of the different journals and magazines that may be able to, to help me get the information out. In that situation, I'd really like to have more educational materials, which of course haven't been developed yet. I just have a baseline for what I need to be looking at at this point. But I think by the time I'm ready to reach out to those individuals, I will have a type of product that I can give out information, techniques, things like that, pictures of different techniques that people can be using to protect themselves and so on and so forth. Right now, the next steps in the whole process are that I'm going to be reaching out to my professional association, my occupational therapy associations, and trying to disseminate some of the things that I found here. And then hopefully that can help me find some pathways for getting this information out easier as well. There are also individuals within my professional associations that would probably be interested and have some information to help me do that as well. Okay. And they're a lot more interested in like the nitty gritty research part of it. Like, what did you do and what can you prove type things? Um, whereas barriers are like, so what can you do for me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not much yet, to be 100% honest. I loved this project and it was my baby for six months and it produced some really cool information. Well, I'm, I'm glad you were willing to share it with us. For those who, who their interest has been piqued by this conversation, are there ways that they can get a hold of you to, to find out what you're doing or are you going to have a Facebook thing set up or? would be the best way for people to get in contact with you? It's not necessarily a business because I, I don't want this to be something where people are like, so how much do I have to pay you for you to help me? I, I don't I don't want it to ever be that. Right. So, I mean, anybody can reach out personally if they have questions like my personal Facebook page, but eventually I will set up and probably share through that a farrier's help type Facebook page where that's constantly sharing tips each and every day or maybe a cool little tidbit 
fun fact that I learned from a farrier that day or and I still have really great contacts with these guys. You guys are all great people and it's <laughs> super fun to have made as many friends as I have. Lots of fun. I loved it so much. <laughs> no, it sounds like you found a, a pretty good sample. I did. Yeah, when you start your Dr. Shortbridge's page, <laughs> let me know. And and if you ever do have an event, let me know as well so I can promote it here. I would really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's a long day. so I really appreciate you.